Dear Dr. Chen, ladies and gentlemen, friends, it gives me great pleasure to attend the 20th Shangri-La Dialogue. I want to first thank Dr. Chen and the WIWS for your invitation. My thanks also go to the government and Ministry of Defense of Singapore for your great hospitality. In China, we have a city called Shangri-La in Yunnan province, and a small town also called Shangri-La in Sichuan province. Shangri-La is synonymous with the utopia of purity, beauty, harmony, and serenity. And here we are at the Shangri-La Hotel. Though we are from different parts of the world, I believe we are all here for world peace and development and for the well-being of people in the Asia-Pacific. Today, as we look around, we see sluggish global economic recovery, resurging cold war mentality, rising regional conflicts and security threats emerging one after another. Our world is far from tranquil, and people across the countries long for peace, development, and cooperation. President Xi Jinping has proposed the Global Security Initiative, or GSI, and he calls for promoting common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security, and exploring a new path to security featuring dialogue over confrontation, partnership over alliance, and win-win over the zero sum. The GSI contributes China's wisdom to addressing global security challenges. And today, I would like to share with you China's ideas on how to flesh out the GSI, assess prospects for security cooperation in the Asia-Pacific, and elaborate on China's position on relevant issues. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, the Asia-Pacific is a shared home where regional countries live and thrive. The sustained prosperity and stability in our region hinges on a sound security and development environment. This is something that has not come easily, and regional countries have done so much to have made it possible. On the other hand, we should not ignore that the Asia-Pacific faces unprecedented security challenges. People cannot but ask these questions. Who is disrupting peace in the region? What are the root causes of chaos and instability? And what should we stay vigilant and guard against? These questions must be answered in the interests of the security, stability, and future of the Asia-Pacific. Therefore, we must make wise choices by standing on the right side of history and promoting the common interests of regional countries. First, mutual respect should prevail over bullying and hegemony. Facts have proven that where there is hegemonism and power politics, there will be instability, chaos, and even worse. We in China believe that the key for countries to live in harmony is mutual respect and treating each other as equals. We are strongly opposed to imposing one's own will on others, placing one's own interests above those of others, and pursuing one's own security at the expense of others. Some country has willfully interfered in other countries' internal affairs and meddled in the affairs of other countries, and frequently resorted to unilateral sanctions and coercion with force. It has inject, incited color revolutions and proxy wars in different regions, created chaos and turbulence and just walked away, leaving a mess behind. We must never allow such things to happen again in the Asia-Pacific. 
The essence of mutual respect lies in respecting each other's strategic autonomy and the right to development. On the contrary, hedonism essentially deprives others of their strategic autonomy and the right to development. China firm, firmly supports ASEAN centrality and its strategic autonomy. We are committed to promoting cooperative, collective, and common security in our region on the basis of mutual respect. Second, fairness and justice should transcend the law of the jungle. All countries, big or small, strong or weak, rich or poor, are equal members of the international community. International affairs should be handled by all countries through consultation, rather than be dictated by one or a few countries. China advocates and stays committed to improving justice and equity in the world, and firmly upholds the UN-centered international system. The international order underpinned by international law and basic norms governing international relations based on the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. We practice multilateralism and pursue win-win cooperation. Some countries, however, take a selective approach to rules and international laws. It likes forcing its own rules on others, and even attempts to constrain others with a convention itself has not acceded to. Its so-called rules-based international order never tells you what the rules are and who made these rules. It practice, practices exceptionalism and double standards and only serves the interests and follows the rules of a small number of countries. A just and equitable environment for development meets the shared interests of Asia-Pacific countries. Anyone who attempts to fleece the flock or prey on the weak will surely be opposed by countries in the region. Third, eliminating conflicts and confrontation through mutual trust and consultation. It is natural for countries to disagree with each other, but there are two approaches to addressing differences. One is exacerbating tension and adding fuel to flames, while the other is seeking consensus and promoting reconciliation and negotiations. It is quite clear which one is the right choice. China is committed to upholding peace in handling international crises. On issues concerning the Middle East, the Korean Peninsula, and Ukraine, China has played a constructive role and made great efforts to cool down the situation and facilitate political reconciliation. Meanwhile, some country is expanding military bases, reinforcing military presence, and intensifying arms race in the region, and transferring nuclear weapon technologies to a non-nuclear state. All such practices, which it often resorts to, are designed to make enemy, stoke confrontation, fuel the fire, and fish in troubled waters. As a matter of fact, regional countries have every wisdom and capability to settle their differences and disputes. At the end of the day, only enhancing dialogue and communication and promoting solidarity and cooperation will ensure stability in our region. Fourth, preventing block confrontation with openness and inclusiveness. The Cold War mentality is now resurging and greatly increases security risks of block confrontation in the Asia-Pacific. Some big power continue to promote uh, its so-called Indo-Pacific strategy. China holds that no strategy should be based on ideological ground and aim to build exclusive 
military alliances against imagined threats, as this could easily lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy. The true design of pushing for NATO-like military alliances in the Asia-Pacific is to hold countries in the region hostage and play out conflict and confrontation. Such attempts will only plunge the region into a whirlpool of division, disputes, and conflicts. History has proven that bloc politics, division, and confrontation have never delivered genuine security. They can only escalate tensions and destabilize the region. Today, what Asia-Pacific needs are big pies of open and inclusive cooperation, not small cliques that are self-serving and exclusive. We must never forget the catastrophes inflicted by the two world wars and the Cold War. And we must never allow such tragedies to happen again. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, China is committed to promoting world peace and development with concrete actions. The Communist Party of China Uniting and leading the Chinese people in concerted efforts of several generations has successfully blazed a Chinese path to modernization. One distinctive feature of the Chinese path is peaceful development. This is an invaluable guide for our way forward that we have developed through years of hardships and dedicated efforts. The achievements China has made come from the hard work, diligence, and creativity of more than one billion Chinese people, not from aggression, expansion, and plundering. Wherever China goes, we focus on building capacity, seeking cooperation, and promoting development. This is widely recognized by the international community. As a Chinese saying goes, a just cause should be pursued for common good. China is ready to join hands with all countries on the path towards modernization and create new opportunities for global stability and prosperity. First, Chinese modernization has become a powerful force driving development for all. As a major country with more than 1.4 billion people, China is pursuing modernization in a peaceful way, and this will surely inject a strong impetus into global development and progress. In the past decade, China's contribution to global economic growth averaged 38.6%. Today, China is a major trading partner of more than 140 countries and regions. Last year, trade between China and ASEAN reached 6.52 trillion RMB yuan, or 923 billion US dollars. And China and ASEAN are each other's biggest trading partners. China has eradicated extreme poverty and provided much-needed poverty alleviation assistance to many developing countries. As of April this year, China has provided over 2.3 billion doses of vaccines to more than 120 countries and international organizations, including over 600 million doses to ASEAN countries. The Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, has become a well-received international public good and a platform for international cooperation. Thanks to the BRI, Many countries now have access to cross-border railway cargo transportation. Some are able to build their first subway line. Some no longer need to transport their goods for domestic consumption via a third country. And people in some countries now have 24-hour supply of drinking water. More and more countries have benefited from the BRI. China will continue to pursue a mutually beneficial opening up strategy and pursue high standard opening up and deliver more development benefits to people of other countries.
Second, Chinese modernization has contributed significantly to safeguarding world peace. Peaceful development is enshrined in China's constitution. We firmly pursue a national defense policy that is defensive in the first place and have endeavored to safeguard world and regional security. Since 2008, China has sent over 139 naval vessels in 44 groups, providing protection to over 7,000 Chinese and foreign ships. In April this year, POA Navy ships evacuated from Port Sudan 940 Chinese citizens and more than 230 foreign citizens. Over the years, China has sent over 50,000 peacekeepers to UN peacekeeping operations making it the largest troop-contributing country among the permanent members of the UN Security Council. We have maintained exchanges and cooperation on peacekeeping with more than 100 countries and international or regional organizations, including ASEAN. Also to our great sorrow, 16 POA service members never came back home from their peacekeeping missions. Right at the moment, more than 2,000 Chinese peacekeepers are on duty in seven peacekeeping mission areas. I once read a line written by a Chinese soldier on his mission, and here I quote, if people ask why going to such dangerous places to keep peace, please tell them someone must step forward to safeguard the fundamentals of human civilization." Quote. This is a simple wish of a Chinese soldier. It is also a solemn commitment made by the Chinese military to the world. Third, Chinese modernization has played its role in improving global governance. Facing growing deficits in global governance, China holds high the banner of multilateralism and endeavors to follow a vision of global governance featuring extensive consultation, joint contribution, and shared benefits. We take seriously the legitimate security concerns of other countries and are committed to advancing global security governance. China upholds justice and equity and commits itself to bridging differences and enhancing solidarity. On the Ukraine issue, China has taken an objective and impartial stance based on the merits of the issue. We have published China's position on the political settlement of the Ukraine crisis and sent a special representative of the Chinese government on Eurasian affairs to have consultations with relevant parties. And we will continue to seek the broadest common ground possible among the international community for resolving the crisis. On the Afghan issue, China has initiated international coordination and hosted or participated in a number of relevant meetings. We have released China's position on the Afghan issue and provided 350 million RMB yuan or 49.5 million US dollars worth of humanitarian aid to Afghanistan. We will continue to work for ending chaos and restoring stability in Afghanistan without interfering in its internal affairs. Recently, in accordance with the important consensus reached between President Xi Jinping and leaders of Saudi Arabia and Iran, the later two countries held a dialogue in Beijing and signed a joint statement on restoring diplomatic relations. Their rapprochement has led to a chain reaction of reconciliation in the Middle East. This is a victory of dialogue and a victory of peace. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, the Asia-Pacific is the fastest growing region with the greatest potential and most dynamic cooperation in the world. Given the grave and complex international security situation today, what we need most is an Asia-Pacific with lasting stability. Rather than chaos and turbulence, China stands ready to work with all parties to enhance our commitment to an Asia-Pacific community with a shared future 
promote sound development of regional security cooperation, strive to build an open, inclusive, transparent, and equitable architecture, and pursue wider prospects for security in the Asia-Pacific. First, China is ready to work with all other parties to build stronger security and confidence-building systems. As the Chinese saying goes, lasting friendship is built upon heart-to-heart -heart exchanges. China calls on all countries to strengthen strategic communication and mutual understanding, build trust and dispel misunderstanding. On issues that can be resolved in the near term, the relevant parties should engage in sincere consultation and work in the same direction for their early settlement. As to issues that cannot be resolved for the moment, disputing parties should maintain candid consultations, manage differences, and build up confidence with each other. The ASEAN way, which features fundamental principles of mutual respect, consensus through consultation, and accommodating each other's comfort level, is a successful practice of the Asian wisdom. China will continue to deepen military exchanges and build stronger security partnerships with other countries. We will follow the guidance of high-level engagement between defense and military leaders enhance personnel exchanges at different levels and establish various direct hotlines to expand communication channels. We are committed to resolving maritime and land border issues in a peaceful manner through negotiations and consultation and to strengthen friendly ties with our neighbors. Second, China is ready to work with all other parties to promote more equitable security rules. The Asia-Pacific will not be secure without right rules and good governance. Setting security rules does not mean reinventing the wheel or overturning the existing rules. Rather, countries should abide by the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and complement and refine existing rules to make the international order fairer and more equitable. Staying committed to the UN Charter, China has joined almost all universal intergovernmental organizations and acceded to more than 500 international conventions. Together with ASEAN countries, we will continue to accelerate consultations on the Code of Conduct in the South China Sea, or COC. We will manage risks and crises by advancing air and maritime security talks and strictly following and continuously improving the Code of Unplanned Encounters at Sea, or Q. We will address security issues in emerging areas and explore the formulation of rules for space, cyber, and biological security. In short, we will work towards a widely accepted, fair, and equitable system of security rules. Third, China is ready to work with all other parties to improve multilateral security mechanisms. China has established defense and security dialogue mechanisms with over 50 countries, and on this basis, we'll continue to promote multilateral security mechanisms. We will continue to support the institutional building of the Conf Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia, or SICA. Together with other Shanghai Cooperation Organization as CO member states, we will optimize its defense cooperation mechanisms, revise its relevant regulations, and gradually improve the functioning of its expert working groups. We will actively participate in multilateral security dialogue and cooperation mechanisms, including the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus, or ADM Plus, the ASEAN Regional Forum, Moscow Conference in International Security, and the Shangri-La Dialogue, and hold the China ASEAN Defense Minister's informal meeting on a regular basis. China hosts the Beijing Shanghai Forum in the second half of each year to provide a platform for exchanges on security cooperation. Here, I'd like to invite you to attend the forum in China later this year. Fourth, China is ready to work with all other parties to carry out more effective defense and security cooperation. China has conducted various practical cooperation with other countries to maintain security in the Asia-Pacific. 
We have actively hosted or participated in joint exercises or tabletop exercises on counterterrorism, maritime security, and HADR under ADMM Plus, which effectively improved the capabilities of regional countries in addressing non-traditional security challenges. Since 2002, China has held around 300 joint exercises with more than 60 countries. Going forward, China will continue to participate in cooperation on military medicine, humanitarian mind action, and peacekeeping under the ASEAN framework. We will deepen and expand bilateral and multilateral exchanges with other countries in the region on equipment and technology, military academies, logistics support, military culture, military meteorology, and public health. We will continue to pra participate in joint exercises, including China-Russia Joint Sea, SAO Peace Mission, China Cambodia Golden Dragon, China Singapore Cooperation Exercises, and the Arman Yi exercise among China, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. China is also willing to participate in joint exercises organized by other countries at their invitation. We will do our best to help other countries in the region enhance their defense capabilities and deliver more public security goods for the international community. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, Throughout its 5,000-year history, the Chinese nation has always valued peace and harmony. Since the founding of the People's Republic of China more than 70 years ago, we never started a conflict, occupied an inch of foreign land, or waged a proxy war. China has one of the best peace records among major countries. China stays committed to the path of peaceful development, but we will never hesitate to defend our legitimate rights and interests, let alone sacrificing the nation's core interests. As the lyrics of a well-known Chinese song goes, when friends visit us, we welcome them with fine wine. When jackals or wolves come, we will face them with shotguns. This illustrates the Chinese people's character of being friendly and kind, but not intimidated by strong power. With that, I want to underline China's position on the following issues. On the Taiwan question, it is the core of China's core interests. Taiwan is an internal affair of China, which is a primary and indisputable fact. Taiwan is China's Taiwan, and how to resolve the Taiwan question is a matter for the Chinese to decide. It brooks no interference from foreign forces. As a matter of fact, over 180 countries entered into diplomatic ties with China with the political commitment of abiding by the One China Principle. The one China principle has become a universally recognized basic norm governing international relations. It is written in black and white in the Cairo Declaration and the Potsdam Proclamation that Taiwan shall be restored to China as part of the post-World War II international order. Both the mainland and Taiwan belong to one and the same China. This is an indisputable fact. Any act to obscure or hollow out the one China principle is both absurd and dangerous. In fact, who is undermining stability across the Taiwan Strait? I think the answer is clear. The Democratic Progressive Party or DPP authorities in Taiwan deny the 1992 consensus and have continuously pushed for incremental Taiwan independence. They have tried hard to erase the Chinese identity of Taiwan and manipulated and hijacked public opinion. Meanwhile, some big power has repeatedly sold arms to Taiwan, provided military training assistance to it, and upgraded official exchanges with Taiwan. These moves greatly violated its own promises. People across the world can see clearly that the root cause of tensions across the Taiwan Strait are the DDP authorities soliciting foreign support for independence and some foreign forces attempt to contain China with Taiwan and interfere in China's internal affairs. Let me make it clear once again. The more rampant the separatist activities for Taiwan independence are, the more resolute our countermeasures will be, and all foreign interference will end up in failure. China's reunification is an overriding historical trend and an unstoppable course. The Taiwan question 
arose as a result of weakness and chaos in our nation, and it will be resolved as national rejuvenation becomes a reality. China must be and will be reunified. It is the aspiration of a people, and in line with the trend of our times, we will strive for the prospect of peaceful reunification with utmost sincerity and greatest efforts, but we make no promise to renounce the use of force. If anyone dares to separate Taiwan from China, the Chinese military will not hesitate for a second. We will fear no opponents and resolutely safeguard national sovereignty and territorial integrity, regardless of any cost. On South China Sea, thanks to the concerted efforts of regional countries, the situation in the South China Sea has generally remained stable, and regional exchanges and cooperation have grown stronger. A sound momentum towards greater stability must not be disrupted. Every year, tens of thousands of ships from different countries sail through the South China Sea, transporting a total of 3.5 trillion U.S. dollars of goods to all parts of the world. We have never heard any of these ships having any trouble passing through or facing any security threats. However, we do see some countries outside the region exercise their hegemony of navigation in the name of freedom of navigation. They want to muddy the waters so they can rake in profits. Regional countries should stay highly vigilant and firmly reject these acts. Solidarity among regional countries needs to be cherished. China and ASEAN countries are connected by geography, culture, and family bonds. People in this region treat each other like brothers and sisters. It is natural for neighbors to disagree with each other from time to time. While countries in the region are engaging in communication and consultation for proper settlement of differences, some countries outside the region keep sowing discourse among us and fanning the flame. We need to stay clear-eyed and level-headed over the benefits and risks. The prospects for regional peace and cooperation are promising. Only by strengthening practical cooperation and expanding common interests can we better achieve more win-win and all-win outcomes. China will join hands with other regional countries, keeping in mind the big picture and long-term interests fully and effectively implement the DOC and push forward the negotiations of the COC so as to build the South China Sea into a sea of peace, friendship, and cooperation. On China-U.S. relationship, it bears on global strategic stability and is the focus of global attention. The Chinese side believes that China and the United States should live up to the expectations of countries in the world and follow the trend of the times. The China-U.S. relationship is more than a bilateral relationship and has its global significance. The international community looks for some and stable relationship and is concerned about any potential conflict or confrontation. It is undeniable that a severe conflict or confrontation between China and the U.S. will be an unbearable disaster for the world. China believes that a major country should behave like one. Instead of provoking block confrontation for self-interests, it should bear in mind the interests of all, resolve differences through exchanges and cooperation, and meet the aspirations of countries in the world. China and the U.S. should not forget the history and need to draw lessons from history. China and the U.S. have different systems and are different in many other ways. However, they should not keep the two sides from seeking common ground and common interests to grow bilateral ties and deepen cooperation. History has proven time and again that both China and the United States will benefit from cooperation and lose from confrontation. China seeks to develop a new type of major country relationship with the United States. As for the U.S. side, it needs to act with sincerity, match its words with deeds, and take concrete actions together with China to stabilize the relations and prevent further deterioration. China and the U.S. should properly handle differences, grave difficulties, and find the right way to get along. The past few years have seen China-U.S. relations at a record low since forming diplomatic ties. I believe you all know the cause to such a difficult situation. The world is big enough for countries, including China and the U.S., to grow together.
The right way for China and the U.S. to get along is following the three principles of mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation. Last November, President Xi Jinping and President Joe Biden had a successful meeting in Bali and reached important consensus. We hope the U.S. side will work together with us to follow through the consensus reached by the two heads of state, navigate the bilateral relations back to the right track from the difficult situation so as to deliver more benefits to both countries and the world. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, our dreams are linked. People of different countries are pursuing their own Shangri-La, just like the Chinese people. Long and arduous as our journey may be, we will get to the destination as long as we take concrete steps. Let us work hand in hand to build an Asia-Pacific community of shared future, promote stability, prosperity and development in our region, and make the Asia-Pacific a better place. With that, I conclude my speech. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, General, for that very comprehensive statement of China's approach to uh, the Indo-Pacific. I note that you said that the People's Republic of China will seek to complement and refine existing rules consistent with the UN Charter. And the definition of complementarity and refinement of those rules will no doubt require transparent dialogue and negotiation to ensure full legal interoperability with the principles of the UN uh, Charter to which the PRC is so publicly uh, committed. May I remind everybody that this is the first uh, statement that the uh, Defense uh, Minister of China has made to an international audience. It will be also the first occasion in which he takes uh, any questions in public. and. Uh, our approach will be that I will take four or five uh, crisp questions and comments from the audience and then invite the general maybe to respond in two or three minutes and then return for another round of perhaps up to six questions. Uh, we have 44 people who have sought the floor, uh, so I will have to be uh, emotionally intelligent in my distribution of offers uh, and I offer the first uh, to Mayor Noens from the Netherlands and also from the IISS. Thank you, John, and thank you, General. It is uh, wonderful to see you here and very important that you are here as well to present China's perspective on regional security. A report emerged yesterday that a Chinese naval vessel carried out an aggressive maneuver resulting in a near collision when it changed direction and came within 150 yards of a U.S. American destroyer transiting through the Taiwan Strait, where foreign, including military vessels and aircraft, have the right of passage under UNCLOS. I would be grateful if you could please explain how this type of behavior supports China's desire for peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait and the wider region, and if you could also please explain why the PRC continues to refuse the United States' requests to engage in military-to-military -military communication and establish crisis communications, which seem incredibly important at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And from the United States, Bonnie Glazer. Thank you, John. Um, well, my question was similar. Um, I wanted to point out also what took place in the Taiwan Strait yesterday. I also wanted to note that the dangerous maneuver was not only unprofessional, it was in contravention of the Convention on the International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea, which is one of the f more than 500 conventions that uh, China has joined, which General Lee has mentioned. I think a collision clearly would put lives at risk. It would cause a major crisis that could escalate to a broader conflict. So I would also like to hear General Lee explain how such um, an accident would advance Chinese interests were it to take place. And isn't it necessary 
to resume the military maritime consultative agreement and other mechanisms of dialogue between the United States and China. You called for enhancing dialogue and strategic communication. Does that include dialogue with the United States military and the defense officials? Thank you. Thank you. And from the Philippines, J. Tristan Tariella. Good morning. You mentioned China wants to promote dialogue over confrontation. So my question is about the apparent disconnect between China's words and actions related to its maritime interaction with the Philippines and perhaps with others in the region. For example, when President Marcos and President Xi met in Beijing, they agreed to manage differences through peaceful means and to promote freedom of navigation and overflight above South China Sea and reach consensus on the powerful resolution of disputes on the basis of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. But in the same month, Filipino fishermen were simply fishing in Philippines' exclusive economic zone, were harassed and driven away by China Coast Guard in violation of international law. The following month, your Coast Guard directed a military-grade laser into the Philippine Coast Guard vessel inside the Philippine exclusive economic zone under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. So while China is talking dial about dialogue, China's actions show confrontation. Thus, my question is, why is there a big difference between China's words and its actions? Thank you. And finally, before we return uh, to the general, one more question and a reminder that we will come back for another <clears throat> four or five questions afterwards. The next from Vietnam, Wang Tai Ha. Thank you. Um, generally, you meant and highlights the importance of equity and justice throughout your speech. I would like to know how you see justice and equity be applied in the South China Sea disputes where China has competing uh, maritime and territorial claims with Southeast Asian countries. And to use, uh, to, to borrow the questions that you eloquently raised in your speech, what are the rules and who make the rules I would like to add, are, they, are these rules, are they or are they not uh, anchored uh, in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea? Thank you very much. You might take two to three minutes, General, to answer those five questions and then we'll come back. A couple of them are similar. Uh, Thank you to the response to the questions raised by the scholars from the Netherlands and uh, the United States and also the other scholars. I think there are similarities in those questions uh, regarding maritime issues. I said in my speech that we must observe the UNCLOS. That is, of course, a must. Freedom of navigation, innocent passage, we have not seen any problem with that. What is key now is that we must prevent attempts that want to use those freedom of navigation and innocent passage as a pretext to exercise hegemony of navigation. As defense minister, every day I see a lot of information about foreign vessels and fighter jets coming to areas near our territory. They're not here for innocent passage. They're here for provocation. So we have to observe, in order to truly observe UNCLOS, we have to fully understand the essence of this convention and abide by the code stipulated in this convention. I find a lot of interest in South China Sea. And on this issue, for China, we operate under the Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in South China Sea and promote negotiations on and consultations on Code of Conduct. You asked about the rules. Uh, what are the rules we abide by? These are the rules we abide by. And the principle we uphold is consensus. We discuss together to work out 
uh, code of conduct uh, that applies uh, to all the stakeholders. I wonder if that uh, uh, meets. Uh, I, I wonder if that is uh, adequate response to your questions. I think that's right. I think people uh, might like a comment if you're able uh, to offer it on uh, uh, what happened yesterday. Allow me to add a few more points about the interactions between China and the United States. The China is open to communication between our two countries and also between our two militaries. So far, our two countries and two militaries have smooth communications about channels at different levels. But we have our principles to communication. We hope our exchanges cooperation will be based on mutual respect. That is the fundamental principle. If we do not even have mutual respect, then our communication will not produce, will not be productive. Mutual respect and quality should be the fundament foundation for our communications. I'll take another five questions. Thank you, General, from the floor. Uh, Francois Eisbourg from France. Thank you, John. Uh, during the revolution of 1848, during which Karl Marx wrote the manifesto of the Communist Party, one of the participants in the revolutionary events at the time was quoted as saying, Un willst du nicht mein Bruder sein, so schlag ich dir den Schädel ein. In English, that translates as, If you don't want to be my brother, I'll knock in your skull. This was obviously not win-win language. Beyond your reminder that China does not renounce the use of force in dealing with the Taiwan situation, what is the Chinese Communist Party, the body to which the People's Liberation Army answers, what is the CCP ready to do to convince the inhabitants of Taiwan that your intentions are brotherly in a way which is different from that of the revolutionaries of 1848. Thank you very much. It's a lesson in applied history, I think, some academics like to term that. Tim Huxley, the former executive director of ISS Asia, who worked with us for a long time in the early years of establishing the Shangri-La Dialogue. Tim. Thank you very much, John. Generally, Thank you for your speech. My question concerns the military implications of the war in Ukraine. General, I wonder if you could please say something about whether it's possible to draw any lessons in areas such as doctrine, leadership, operational and tactical conduct, logistics, military organization, and also equipment and training from the war in Ukraine. One possible lesson, of course, concerns the balance between the offense and the defense. Is it perhaps, in Joe and Lai's words, too early to say, uh, or are some ramifications of the Ukraine war uh, already becoming apparent? Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. And from uh, France, Lebanon, and also the IISS, Emil Hokayam. Thank you, John, and thank you for your remarks, uh, General Lee. You mentioned the key role of China in facilitating the agreement between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, and the Islamic Republic of Iran. This was a remarkable diplomatic <clears throat> moment. Uh, does the fact that China facilitated this agreement mean that China is also taking responsibility for its implementation? Linked to that, could you please tell us more about China's defense relations in the Gulf region, including potential arms sales and defense cooperation, particularly with Iran? Is, is China interested in playing a bigger role in uh, Gulf security? Thank you. Thank you very much, Emil. And I might say that the International Institute for Strategic Studies since 2004 has run a, a sister dialogue, as it were, uh, in the Kingdom of Bahrain that brings together uh, all the relevant actors there, and we look forward to China's participation uh, in, in that. From Myanmar, Ki Sin. Uh, thank you, General, for your speech. Uh, 
Uh, just four days before the Shangri-La Dialogue, Major General Yan Yan, the Acting Director General of the Intelligence Bureau of Myanmar's uh, China CMC, visited Myanmar military and met the Hunter chief. So there were concern about China sharing military intelligence with Hunter to assist their military campaign against the pro-democracy groups in Myanmar. What is the purpose of the meeting? And that's my first question. And another question is, uh, what is the extent of military cooperation between China and Myanmar military Honda? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I might take two more because I think we have that time. From Australia, Michael Fullilove. Thank you, John. General, as a professional military officer, how do you account for the deeply unimpressive performance of the Russian military in Ukraine? Has this changed your perceptions of Russia's strength and reliability as a partner for China? And finally, from the IISS, but also Indonesia, Evan Lexmana. Uh, thank you, John, and thank you, General. As part of the GSI that you uh, led the speech with, are there plans to improve the quality and the frequency uh, of China's military diplomacy in Southeast Asia? In particular, are we expecting to see more PLA officers studying at Southeast Asian Staff and Command Colleges, more complex uh, joint exercises, uh, and perhaps even defense industrial collaboration in the future? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, General, you have another three minutes to address those six or seven uh, questions. Uh, I hope you see that we have a very diverse and international gathering here and lots of perspectives from different uh, parts of the world in which China is engaged. So, please, sir. Thank you very much for this question. First of all, I want to respond to the second and the fifth questions regarding Ukraine. We now my focus is on military diplomacy about the combat practices. I haven't spent a lot of my time on those areas. So I'm not able to give a highly professional answer to those questions. What I want to say that we are working, the priority of our focus now is promoting talks for peace. And based on that principle, we do our best to mediate, to encourage all parties to contribute to the efforts for peace talks so that the crisis will be resolved as soon as possible through a political and diplomatic manner about the reconciliation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. You mentioned, you asked about whether China will do more work in this regard. No, of course, China will make our efforts make greater efforts to promote peace, cooperation, and development. I also want to say that I can feel a lot of expectations for China. You expect China to do more in the Middle East. But I want to say Saudi Arabia, Iran, and other countries in the region are the main players for promoting peace, stability, and development in the region. And in response to the question from the scholar from Indonesia about Global Security Initiative. Will the Chinese military have more exchanges in Southeast Asia? I can be frank with you that in the past few days here in the Shanghai Dialogue, I have had meetings with 11 country, uh, defense officials of 11 countries. We have a very important common understanding. And that is, our militaries should have more and deeper and more extensive communication exchanges. And based on that consensus, we will 
work with militaries in Southeast Asian countries for exchange programs and cooperation. And our purpose is to promote peace, stability, and security of our region. And before I conclude, I also want to respond to questions regarding Taiwan. Our position on this question is clear. No matter which perspective you take when analyzing this question, one fact is clear. Taiwan is an, a, is an inalienable part of China. The Chinese government and the Chinese military will never tolerate any incident that could lead to a divided China. And at present, in particular, we will not tolerate attempts by Taiwan independence separatist forces and external forces to separate Taiwan from China. And uh, well, you mentioned uh, 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 the words that if you are not my brother, then I will knock your skull. Well, I need to maybe read more about <laughs> that uh, in history books. I did not see that in the Thank you very much, General. Just, just before we close, we have perhaps 30 seconds more. There were one or two questions on the floor uh, about... Uh, maneuvers that took place recently at sea and in the air where perhaps uh, Chinese vessels and Chinese aircraft are thought to have come too close to others operating in international waters or in international airspace. Do you uh, have a point on that, please? Uh, we codes for in Congress at sea and in air uh, uh, reached with many other countries to prevent unnecessary dangers. But I want to also raise a question. The incidents you mentioned, why did all these incidents happen in areas near China? Not in areas near other countries? I think that is because Chinese naval vessels or Chinese fighter jets will not do those hegemony of navigation actions in areas near other countries. To truly prevent such incidents in the future, we not only need the codes we have already have, the best way is for all the countries, especially the naval vessels and fighter jets of all countries, not to do closing actions around other countries' territories. What's the point going there? For China, we, we always say, mind your own business. Take good care of your own vessels, your fighter jets. Take good care of your own territorial airspace and waters. If that is the case, then I don't think there will be uh, future problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. Well, delegates, this is the first time in uh, 24 hours that I've ended a session one minute late. But I think uh, we added certainly one minute of value, if not more. Thank you, General, for choosing the Shangri-La Dialogue to make your first international public statement and Excuse for me. making your first... Uh, Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, well, allow me to this opportunity to share send one message. I look forward to in more in-depth exchanges with all the scholars well, because we have very short time here uh, uh, in the limit of time we are not able to have very in-depth discussions and are open to more discussion with you on security and development so that we can better understand your opinions and positions of uh, us and different countries so that you will be also able to better understand China's position views. Thank you very much.